Necessary. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, David. Uh, so, those of you, you who were here uh, in the spring meeting, uh, if you like, this is part two. Um, back in the spring, I introduced my talk with this slide, so here it comes again. Uh, Velikovsky chronology. In Ramesses II and his time, Velikovsky claimed that the Battle of Kadesh fought between Egyptians and a Hittite coalition was the same as the Battle of Karkonid. And uh, his argument, if you, if you remember the book, forms a large part of that, uh, of that book. Uh, what I'm wanting to do, as I did last time, is say, well, yes, there's lots of arguments about whether the two battles are the same, but if they were, then Putting those battles together puts a lot of history together as well. And so you can't just argue about the battle. You've got to look earlier and later, because that must tie up as well. Now, uh, in my last presentation, what I did was go past those two battles and look at the history about 40, 50 years later in both cases. Uh, what I'm doing today is going the other way, to look at earlier rather than later. Again, this is more or less the uh, slide I had last time. Velikovsky's reconstruction requires that the battle, and therefore Egyptian and Hittite history, has to be downdated by something around 670 years, which of course is absolutely drastic. Uh, the Battle of Karkamish, pretty well dated to 605 BC. So Velikovsky was pulling down the Battle of Kadesh by about 670 years to make them the same thing. We have been discussing this in SIS for some time. Uh, in review in 2016, there was a lot of discussion about the battle itself. In 2017, we not only looked in more detail at the battles, but also looked in a few years after and found that uh, the next three, four, five, six years seems to fit quite well with the two histories. And as I said, on the spring meeting, I took a jump forward and looked at about 40 years later in both the history of around 550 BC and the history from Hittite and Egyptian history, which, as I said, had been brought down by hundreds and hundreds of years. So this is what Velikovsky was doing. He was taking the Battle of Kadesh, usually dated about 1274 BC, and say that's the same battle as Nebuchadnezzar fought at Carchemish in 605 BC. <coughs> he took that and brought it down. But as I said, you can't just compare the battles. If he was right about the battles, then the, the Battle of Kadesh pulls down probably a, at least a hundred years of history before and after that you can't, you can't separate. Uh, and uh, so what we did uh, in the spring meeting was looked at this 1230 BC history and said does that compare in any way with the history around 550 BC? Uh, now what I'm doing today is going in the other direction, not look at the, the later generation but the previous one, and bringing down history that is conventionally dated around 1320 and comparing it with history around 640 BC. So, as I said, this is drastic. Velikovsky, <laughs> to most people, was doing something which just is untenable. But I think you'll be surprised at the results. So, what we have now, uh, a further test, spring meeting, I said the history is sometime after the next generation must fit. If Velikovsky was right, then does the Egyptian Hittite history agree with the history of the 7th century BC, but now decades before the battles, rather than last time we looked at decades after the battles? And just to summarise uh, the spring meeting, because we were looking at dates uh, later than 605 BC, uh, we were comparing Hittite and Babylonian texts about 50 years after the battles. And 
all these things tied up in the two histories. We've got the one from 13 or 1300 right down, placed it by uh, around 550 BC, and we found that uh, in both cases there was rebellion in southern Anatolia involving two specific places named in both the histories, uh, and the various kings, Hittite kings, Babylonian kings, campaigned in Cilicia to put the rebellion down. In both cases Cyprus was threatened, there were also threats recorded to both south and north of Ugarit in, in uh, northern Syria, uh, around Hamath and the Amanus Mountains. We found that the Babylonian record actually talked of the army being both Babylonian troops of Akkad and Hittite uh, troops. So that pulled the two histories together. And then two very distinctive things popped up. In both histories, there was a fugitive with very similar names. And uh, in both histories, uh, the capital of, uh, of the Hittites at Hattusas um, was destroyed. Um, in uh, later times, that uh, city is called Pateria. Uh, Herodotus talked a bit about it as well, about the destruction. Um, so we put the two destructions together. So there was quite a lot that tied up. So that, that was what we did in the spring meeting. I think encouraging that the two histories uh, seem to be tying up. Today, we're looking back before Kadesh. Now, if we look at Hittite history first, this is history that's normally dated around 1320 BC. The Battle of Kadesh about 1274, something like that. Uh, in Hittite history, before Muatas II, who was the victor at Kadesh, uh, his father, Mercilius II, had been the Hittite king. Mercilius inherited an empire which included eastern Anatolia and northern Syria. The Hittites had been expanding for some time and taking over quite a bit of, uh, of the northern part of the Middle East. And the great thing that happened in the reign of Mercilius is he extended the empire west, right to the Aegean coast. So having ruled eastern Turkey, as we would call it nowadays, he actually campaigned right to the Aegean in western Turkey uh, and uh, uh, campaigned there, suppressed the, the locals and took it over and ruled that area for many years to come. And just a picture of what we're talking about there. Uh, you have the Hittite capital here at Hattusas on the plateau in Turkey. The campaign of Mercilius took him right across to the west and he mentions two or three specific places uh, in the campaign and that's why I've drawn it like that. It goes right through uh, past Ephesus and to uh, Mount Mycali which sticks out into the Aegean uh, not far from the pointing towards the island of Samos. So that's the general direction of Mercilius's campaign. Uh, he calls it the campaign against Arzawa, which was a general Hittite term to cover a large part of, of western Anatolia. The background to the campaign, Mercilius had complained to a king called Ucasitis, who was the king of Arzawa, about the return of soldiers. Mercilius calls these soldiers the Sardana. It's a name which actually crops up in, uh, in Egyptian history as well. It looks as though the Sardana were a group of soldiers provided by Ucasitis as mercenaries in the Hittite army. When Mercilius became king, he was a young chap, probably early 20s, and the various kings thought, oh well, we can get away with this, this guy's a bit young, he's not going to be as powerful as his father. Uh, they were mistaken. But, but what seems to happen is the, this Ucasitis recalled his soldiers. And Mercilius, whether that was the real reason for the attack or just uh, something he, uh, he used as an excuse, he complains that uh, Ucasitis uh, had taken the Sardana troops back and 
he had complained to him to say, no, look, I need them in my army, allow me to have them again. Ukazitis refused, and the Hittites therefore attacked. When the attack occurred, uh, and this is all in the annals of, of Mercedes, um, Ukazitis, the, the king, uh, fled. They, uh, and quite a few of his, his uh, nobles fled to the coast to somewhere called Apazaz. Now, almost all Hittite historians agree that that must be Ephesus. The word is so close. The only worry they have is that did that Ionian city Ephesus actually exist in 1300 BC? Um, but generally, there isn't much argument. Um, if he fled to the coast and escaped to the islands, Apazaz has got to be Ephesus. Others of the, uh, I was along with the royal family and, and a lot of troops, uh, took refuge on my, Mount Mycali and in a place which uh, the Hittites call Perundu. During the assault, Ukazitis died. He wasn't actually killed, as far as we can tell from the records, but he was taken ill, he was an Orish man, uh, he was taken ill and died sometime in his flight to try and get away. Uh, and the campaign, which lasted two years, eventually ends with, with the Hittites besieging this place called Perundu and capturing, uh, uh, I think a, it was a son of Lucasitis and, and some other of his family as well. And that's the general background to the, uh, to the uh, Hittite assault, dated conventionally to 1320 BC. What I'm going to look at now is the history before the Battle of Carchemish. And so we're down now into the, into the 600s BC. History of the decades before the Battle of Carchemish, dominated by Assyria. They were uh, rulers of most of the Middle East at this time. And uh, one of their major kings, Ashurbanipal, uh, ruled for a long time. Typical of a king that rules for a long time, Early in his reign, there was a lot going on and lots of campaigns. He campaigned to Egypt and, and other places. But as typically, as the king got older, there wasn't so much activity internationally. In fact, things settled pretty well. Um, that Assyria, that uh, Assyria still ruled Syria, Palestine, and on and off Egypt, but not for long. Um, but little. Uh, happened on a, a military front with uh, Assyria itself, but the Assyrians did record things that were happening in Anatolia, although they weren't directly involved. Uh, during the reign of uh, Ashurbanipal, uh, the Assyrians had lost control of, of Anatolia. Uh, there were uh, native Hittite kings, and the major thing that's recorded is around 640 BC, uh, the Hittite king and his Cimmerian general, Ligdamis, attacked Lydia. Uh, Gyges, the king of Lydia, died during the attack. And that's recorded uh, not only by uh, the contemporary writings of the Assyrians, but some of the later Greek writers also. Strabo, for one, uh, uh, relates the, uh, the attack by uh, the Hittite king and uh, Ligdamas. The Cimmerians were tribesmen from the northeast of Anatolia who overran the plateau around 700 BC. Slowly they were brought under control and uh, tended to work with the Hittite kings uh, um, in a sort of loose alliance. Uh, the Hittite kings managed to get control of the plateau again and control of the Cimmerians. And the only famous Cimmerian we know is this chap, which Strabo calls Ligdanus. So, uh, 640 BC or thereabouts, Lydia was attacked, but also Ionia. This attack went right to the coast. And in fact, the two major places that are mentioned are Ephesus. Um, where the Greek writer Callanus records the, uh, the violence of the Cimmerians and um, they attacked Ephesus and burned the sanctuary of Artemis at Ephesus. 
the only other uh, contemporary recording about this uh, campaign is from the Ionian town of Praini, uh, which was at the uh, foot of Mount Makali, uh, uh, which shows quite clearly from an inscription that Ligdamis the Cimmerian uh, was there from some time during the assault. A quick look at the two histories, one from 1320 BC, one from 640 BC, and we see there are some comparisons. The major event in both histories is an attack right to the west of uh, Anatolia. Um, in the Hittite history, it was caused by uh, this breakaway of the Sardana soldiers. We notice that in 640 BC, it was Lydia that was attacked, and the capital of Lydia was Sardis. Velikovsky noted that uh, the name Sardana may be linked to Sardis. In both cases, Ephesus was attacked. Uh, as we said, historians are quite happy that the Hittite Apasaz is the same word as Ephesus. Something that historians don't uh, pick up, but I will. We know the Chimerians during the attack were at Priene. Um, the, the city, the, the Hittite text recorded, uh, that was besieged was Perundu. And I'll just note that those are similar names. And in both cases, during the assault, the king that was attacked died rather than he was killed in battle. So, on the face of it, there are a few similarities in the two campaigns. They both talk about similar places, some of the names tied up, and the king died. So, the one on the left in 1320 BC is the, the main event recorded at that time in Anatolia. This one is also the main event that, that occurred uh, in, in the decades around 640 BC. So, there's some similarity there. Even the names may not be as different as they appear. In the Hittite history, we have this, uh, the guy who caused the trouble and, and got attacked called Ukazitis. Now, uh, the guy who gets attacked, the king of Lydia in uh, 640 BC, is called Gigis. That's the Greek form of the name. You find it in Herodotus. Um, the, the form that's been found in contemporary writing is Gugu uh, in uh, the Assyrian writings. They call him Gugu. Some historians have suggested that, trying to work out what, what the word Gugu might mean, they think it's probably uh, the uh, Hittite word Kuka, which means grandfather. And they suggested that the, the term Giges was not a name, but a title. Like the grandfather of the country. We know he was an oldish man at this time. Obviously, Kuka is not that far from Uka. Uh, even the country might tie up. Arzal was a large place, um, bigger than the Arzal were lands that the Hittites refer to, was larger than what we would call uh, Lydia, but part of Arzal was called Luia, which of course isn't that, difficult, that different to. Uh, the Greek form, Lydia, and the Assyrian form, Ludi. So, there is some similarity, possibly, between the name of the king and his country. But there's more, and it particularly involves uh, this guy. What you see here is a seal. Um, in ancient times, the letters were uh, written on clay and baked. And I think we're all familiar with the cuneiform writing of the, the little squiggles in the clay um, to, to, to write the language. Um, the kings, uh, just like in modern times, would have a seal, but not put in wax, but put on the clay. And what we see here is a classic Hittite seal. 
Probably only about that big, of course, because it's just to make an impression on the clay letter to show that it came from the, the leader or king himself. This particular one is called the Tarkon Demos seal. It was not deliberately put identified. It, uh, Sace was the historian who, in the late 1880s, 1890s, really rediscovered Hittites. Uh, they've been lost, really, to, to history. Um, and he, he found out about this scene. Um, in fact, I don't think a, a, an historian has ever seen the actual seal. What Sace found evidence of was um, impressions of a seal which apparently had been lost. He was a little bit concerned that uh, it was genuine and he did a lot of investigation and eventually found a guy in Turkey who remembered uh, the actual silver seal itself and had had the impressions made. So Sace was eventually uh, satisfied that this was a genuine seal. What we see here in the picture is the impression the seal would make. Of course, the guys who carved this in silver had to carve it back to front. The, uh, the, the picture that you wanted on, on the impression was that, uh, and the, the guys who carved it had to, car had to think about it in, in reverse, obviously. So uh, um, it is a very high quality piece of work. When you think how small that is, uh, carved in silver. If we look at the seal, you've got a picture of, of a king. Round the ring, you can see, is actually cuneiform writing. The wedge, cuneiform means wedge shape because, of course, if you, if you scratch a stick through wet clay, you've got a wedge. And so what the artist has done here, here is repeat actually carved in, in the silver, the cuneiform inscription. And Sace had no trouble with this. Uh, the, the, the symbols say, Tarik Tim Nesar Mat Erme, which he turned into a more English uh, setting as Tarku Dimi, King of the Land of Erme. I expect most of you recognize the word Sar is very common in the ancient languages as king. Uh, one thing that Sace noticed was that the symbols of the cuneiform were quite late. He picked up that some of the symbols uh, carved um, were very similar to cuneiform characters from somewhere around the turn of the 8th century BC. Um, so he said it's clear that the seal must come from a, that sort of period. He compared it with some text from the time of Sargon II, about 710, 720 BC, where particular types of some of these uh, characters uh, tied up. And, and so Sace was quite convinced that this seal was quite late. The other thing he, he agonised about was, where was Erme? Hmm. There, is a, there is a land called Erme, usually spelt with a U, occasionally with an A, uh, Erme or Arme. It's the origin of Armenia. It's where, where the name Armenia comes from. Uh, Erme was a land just west of Lake Van, in very eastern Turkey. Um, and uh, Sace thought, well, that's, that's the most likely solution for Erme, but he was a bit concerned because where this seal was found, as far as he, he knew, um, was a long way from Erme. It, uh, it surfaced in Smyrna, which is just north of Ephesus, which was hundreds, <coughs> hundreds of miles from. Uh, from Lake Van. Oliver Gurney, in his definitive book on the Hittites, includes a picture of the seal 
And in fact, that's strictly the seal and that's its impression. Includes it on a, uh, in the uh, plates in his book um, showing various forms of Hittite art. And he put it on the same page as this, which is a, a large stone carving. And as you can see, pretty well identical. I think the only difference I can find between these two, between this and the carving, is the king's hands a little more outstretched. <coughs> um, Gurney made no comment. He talks about the seal and says finding it. He put these on the same page, but he doesn't comment on them at all. And the reason I think he, he was afraid to comment, he obviously thought they went together. The Tarkon Dimas seal is dated to about 700 BC roughly. This carving in stone cannot be later than 1200 BC because it's found in Hattusas, the Hittite capital, which was destroyed around 1200 BC. <laughs> These two are 500 at least, possibly 700 years apart. Identical. As I said, the seal of Tarkon Demos is classic Hittite art. We have a lot of the seals of the Hittite kings, or at least, if not seals, impressions on clay. And the closest of all the Hittite seals to the one of Tarkon Demos is this one. You can see there's a picture in the middle. You've got the cuneiform around it. And much clearer on this one, but they're also on the Tarkon Demos seal, is all these funny symbols. The funny symbols in the circle are Hittite hieroglyphs. Notice that when it's a Hittite king that's represented on the seal, the picture is quite different. The Hittite king, in this case Mubatais II, is the little figure, shown in the embrace of his god. And that's the classic way the Hittite king was represented. He always has this funny scepter and a funny curly staff that he carries around. So what we know from this picture is Tarkon Dimas, or, or Tarkon Dimi, was not a Hittite king. He is not represented like a Hittite king. He is shown quite differently in the carving. <coughs> As I said, this is the seal of Muratalis II, uh, who was the son of Rasilis, and who was the victor in Kadesh over uh, Ramesses II. So this seal dates from, in conventional terms, about 1300, 1280 BC. But in style, it is the closest one to the Tarkaldian seal. So we have, we've seen two things <coughs> contradicting Sais's dating. Sais said the seal comes from around 700 BC, but the same picture appears hundreds of years earlier, a very similar seal occurs over half a millennium earlier. And on to a third Hittite picture. This uh, is quite weathered. Um, it's a carving of the Hittite weather god. Very similar to the god embracing Muwatalis on the seal. Classic Hittite uh, um, art in, in style. Um, and the carving is found at a place called Carabelle which is uh, right over in western Anatolia, a long way from the normal Hittite lands, uh, between Sardis and Ephesus. It's the Hittite weather god, Tarhundus. There's an inscription in hieroglyphs which says, I have won this country with my own shoulders. Why shoulders? I'm not sure, but that's, that's the, uh, the inscription. Clearly, it's a carving to commemorate uh, a capture of 
Western uh, Anatolia. But the remarkable thing noticed by David Hawkins, the great uh, Hittite historian, about, about 20 years ago, there are hieroglyphs carved with this statue, and they're exactly the same hieroglyphs that are on the seal of Tarkondimos. Hittite historians still can't decipher those hieroglyphs. They don't know exactly what they say. You would think they would say the same as the cuneiform, you know, which says Tarku Dimi, King of Irme. They, they think the hieroglyphics say Tarku, but they're not sure about the rest. And, and they still don't know, but whatever they say, those hieroglyphs, that group of hieroglyphs on the Targum uh, Dili seal are identical to the hieroglyphs, presumably, because of the chap that had this card. But the trouble is, again, there's 700 years between them. So we have this seal dated to around 700 BC because of the cuneiform letters. But three issues that are saying it must be much, much earlier, six, seven hundred years earlier. Let's go back and just look at the evidence around 640 BC. Ligdanis, the Cimmerian, who Strabo talks about, typical Greek writer, corrupts the name quite badly. Herodotus was great at that, you know. The Herodotus' form, the forms of uh, names always seem quite different to the ones we know. Lygdamus the Cimmerian, who conquered Lydia and Ionia with the Hittite king in 640 BC, wasn't actually called Lygdamus. His real name is Tugdami, uh, king of Guti. And this is recorded contemporary writings while he was alive by the Assyrians, who uh, he was a pain in the neck to the Assyrians, and, and they record various uh, texts about him, none of which are <coughs> complimentary. So the actual real name of the Cimmerian who attacked Aegis and, and Ephesus uh, and was uh, known to be in Priene, wasn't actually called Ligdamis, he was called Tugdami. The interesting there, of course, is Tugdami is very close to Tarkudimi. In fact, it's so close, it's got to be the same name. And the other thing, the Assyrians called Tugdami king of Guti. Now, the Assyrian land of Guti, or strictly Gutium, Guti were the people, Guti were the place, uh, is actually the same as Urme. Urme is a name used by the Urartians. Um, so, if you look closely at this Ligdamis, the Cimmerian, who, who attacked Gigius, he was actually Tarkudimi, king of the land of Urmi. So it's got to be a racing certainty that the Cimmerian general who, who was heavily involved in the attack on Gigius, actually it's his seal. Forget all the other problems of 700 years difference and whatever. If you just take the seal, uh, which is of Tarkudimi, king of Urme, then it fits perfectly with Tugdami, king of Urme. The Cimmerians settled in Urme in the 7th century BC. So we would expect a king of Urme in the 7th century to be a Cimmerian. So it all fits rather well. Um, we, we also know that the seal was found at Smyrna, close to Ephesus, just where Tugdami was attacking the Ionians. I think, I think if you forget all this problem with links with Hittite art and, and, and dating, if you just look at the 7th century stuff, uh, there can be little doubt that that seal belongs to the Cimmerian general. Of course, the great problem is 
His identical monogram is found on stone in Hattusas, at least 500 years earlier. His seal, and the most similar one to it, is that of Muratalis, 700 years earlier. The hieroglyphs are on the seal of Targudimi are identical to the ones found on the sculpture between Lydia and Ionia, and it's 700 years earlier. There is no way to reconcile the data conventionally. When you look at this, conventional historians have to argue that in 640 BC, Tarkudini conquered Ionia, attacking Ephesus and Priene. Priene, a seal of, seal of Tarkudini, dated this time, was found right there in Smyrna. But the identical monogram of Tarkudini was carved in the Hittite capital at least 500 years earlier. In 1320 BC, roughly, someone with the identical hieroglyphic name also conquered Ionia, attacking Ephesus, and somewhere else with a very similar name to Priene. I think it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to justify that. The coincidence is incredibly strong. So, a conclusion. Uh, a conclusion that covers this talk and the one at the spring meeting. Velikovsky put two battles together that were 670 years apart. We recognise that if you put the battles together, you drag a lot of history down as well. And what we've seen over the uh, two meetings is that you have about 100 years of Hittite history, about 40, 50 years before the battles, 40, 50 afterwards from the time of Rosilius to Tuchelius IV, usually dated to 1320 to 1220 BC, but that hundred years agrees in detail with much later history from 640 to 540 BC. <laughs> now, I did those as tests to Velikovsky, I have to say, his theory stands up rather well. However outlandish and ridiculous we think moving history by 670 years is, there's, that's a phenomenal coincidence. Any questions? <laughs> Don't you see the Phrygians and the Phrygians? The Arzala lands, when Mercedes conquered them, they were, they were a good deal bigger. They're sort of what historians call Arzala proper, which was a, about the land of, uh, of Lydia. But uh, there were other lands uh, east of, of, of Arzawa, Arzawa proper, which were termed the Arzawa lands, um, three of them. And uh, one of them is called the, the Sika River lands, which was the northern one of the three. Now, I think Sika is just a short version of Sakaria which is Sangaris. So the Sika river land that the Hittite histories talk about, I think was Phrygia. Do you comment on any possible connection between uh, the land of Arasawa and the Mycenaeans? And the Mycenaeans? Mycenaeans. Mycenaeans. Um, no, the, the usual connection that historians try to make is not with Arasawa, but with another country mentioned by the Hittites, which is Achaea. Mm -hmm. The Hittites talk of Achaea and Achaeava. Mm -hmm. Now, if I know my Greek, Achaeava sounds like Achaeava, the people of Achaea. Mm -hmm. And historians say, ah, Achaeans? You know, so the later Greeks, not the yeah. Mycenaeans? No, the Achaeans were the Mycenaean Greeks of the home. Oh, yes, yeah. thank you. So that's, so that's, that's a connection that's made. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Achaea occurs quite a bit. The problem is, if you look at the story of Mercilius attacking Ucazitis, he fled to Arzawa with the intention of going to Achaea. Mm -hmm. So that could fit, he'd be going to Greece. But immediately west of Ephesus is Chios. I think Achaea is Chios. 
Um, and there are lots of other things that were tied up. Um, you know what historians are. Anything with an AK has got to be a Keyans. We talked, we talked uh, last time about the Upper Washer. Well, they're thought to be a Keyans. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem, though, because uh, the Upper Washer were circumcised. Mm -hmm. the, the Egyptians had a wonderful way of, of um, recording the number of people they'd killed. <laughs> they, they only kept one small part of the individual. <laughs> um, so that one falls down. And uh, I think there's a much, I, I think a key of it's better for all sorts of reasons. Um, but yes, it is one of the, it, it's one of, it's a commonly stated thing that uh, the Akiyawa or Kia is something to do with the Kians. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? I wasn't clear what you were equating. Are you saying the name Toku Dimi was the same as Mrs? You've got that information, I think there's little doubt about that. We all know that Tarku Dimi conquered Iron Man, that's recorded many times. There's no argument about that. And, and the second But the second bit, we've seen that the identical monogram to the seal was carved 500 years earlier. It means what, so is it the, had two sides. Is the monogram the name of the story? No, the, the, the monogram is the picture. Remember we had it wasn't different. It, it, they were quite different. I mean one was the god with the arm round. No, no. There's the seal of Tarko Demos. Oh, you mean the picture of the man? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I meant by the model. Yeah. Isn't um, that the from the Yazidika? Is that the H or Sanctuary or Yazidika? Oh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, I don't think it is, I think that's yeah. a separate piece of stone. Oh, Yasnikaya, no. No, Yasnikaya is about half a mile from Hattusas. This is, this is actually in Hattusas, in, in, in Bugos Koi, the, uh, the site of Hattusas. Um, yeah, it is a site of Hattusas. Oh, Yasnikaya is a subject on its own. <laughs> okay, okay, you, you quoted Sais as saying the cuneiform uh, was. Uh, 8th, 7th century. Have you got any more recent reference? Um, no. No. Look, nobody disagrees with that, but where historians have tried to do anything about this scene, um, they're inclined to say it's got to be early. Because you've got all, you've got this, and you've got the comparison with the scene of Numatalis, and you've got the uh, the hieroglyphs right here being exactly the same as the caravel inscription of the weather god. So you've got those three things that historians take as counterbalancing Sace's argument about the cuneiform. So they tend to say, well, if we're going to do anything, about the only person who's done anything about this is, is David Hawkins. And um, basically what he's done is say, he doesn't say it, in, he doesn't say it as such, but basically he's ignored Sace's argument. He's not argued that the cuneiform could be early, he just ignored it. Because, because there's three other things pulling pulling the dating back to 1300 BC. Yeah, I can see you say that. Presumably, the, the uh, cuneiform is actually the Hittite language, uh, rather than it's, Syrian. But the, because you're saying the signs are. The, the, the cuneiform is um, it's so basic, you, you can't even talk about language. Um, it's just whether it's a Hittite language or Akkadian written in cuneiform, the individual symbols have the same sounds. The Hittites took over, took over the Akkadian cuneiform, basically, to write their own language. But of course, when... It, it when would be surprising they were quite so simple. Well, the, the actual symbols spell out Tar, Rit, Ten, Me, Sa, Ma, Ur, Me. Which is basic Akkadian, if you like, but the Hittites wouldn't have wouldn't have had different different meaning to those because it's just a name, so it's just sounds. The, the Hittites relied very heavily on on the, the Babylonians and Syrians for their writing. They really just copied it. 
Did you want to answer, please? Presented here actually explains the Trojan War um, as given in Welsh texts. If you understand the Chimerians or the Cymru, uh -huh. and uh -huh. they've now invaded Ionia, which was Greek. King Priam, Priam means the first one, doesn't it? Prius, Priam. The Greeks are invading Troy because of what they've done to Ionia, these Chim uh, Chimerians. No, no, let me finish, let me, let me finish. Let me no. finish. The Welsh texts go on about how they came from that area of Anatolia, the Cymru, and, and then later on there's the Trojan migration to Britain with Brutus. The, and this is all explaining how well, this came about. The Chimerian, by any in, in history of this period, is Greek. Yeah. The Greek wrote so much about it, we all use either biblical names for things or Greek names. Yeah. The original name is Gimirai. Yeah. Um, in fact, before the, the Assyrian word is Gimirai, which yeah. the Greeks turned into Chimerian. Yeah. Not too bad, G and C, K. All right. Um, the Assyrians also called them Casca, mm -hmm. or Gasca, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, in, the, in the early incursions of the Chimerians from the sort of Pontic region in, into the plateau of Anatolia, the, uh, the, the Assyrians around sort of 710 uh, BC talk of the Casca in Bayon. Mm -hmm. uh, Sargo records he built uh, fortresses in Cilicia against the Casca. Yeah. And then sometime, they dominated the plateau for about 30 years. Um, and by the end of that, they, they tend to be called Gimelon. Yeah. Um, but they also use a term uh, Uman Manda, which basically means uh, sort of unruly hordes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they to the Scythians as have well. You, have you read anything from the British Israelites on this? <laughs> The, the, no, the, yeah. the, these people that you're talking about, the Gimari, the name comes from Beth Omri, who was a king of Israel, and they were transferred by the Assyrians in 721 up to the Caspian Sea area. There's rebellion um, in the Assyrian Empire, and during the chaos that followed that, they escaped and went westwards into Anatolia. And these are the people that you're now talking it's about. Generally, thought that the Chimerians came from further north in the Caucasus. Well, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you that this other theory. Mm, yeah. um, well, certainly, uh, this the explains the, the Welsh legends. Right. There's a theory that the Israelites disappeared somewhere up there. Yeah, and then where did they go? The well, they came westwards yeah. and ended up in Wales. <laughs> that might be so. Very nice idea. Welsh Chimerians. the Cumber Odui. I'm Welsh. Oh, well, it took that. Tarkudimi was probably one of your ancestors. Could be. Yeah. But, but, this, <laughs> this, this, all, I'm saying, all I'm saying here is I'm not saying necessarily believe that, but I've read plenty about it. Mm. But it would explain the Trojan War if these people had invaded and the uh, Aegean area and the Greeks came across to get it back. And if this king, Priam, that we hear so much about, Priam means first. I know they got their genealogies back to Darden and all of that. And if the, the word Troy, actually I think, or the Troad, means the triangle then. Because if you look at where, the, where Troy is, it is actually shaped like an equilateral triangle. So you have an explanation then for why, the, why we had the Trojan War. And you've got the date. It must be after this. No, it's, it's much no, later than they the, think. The Trojan War the, was 50 years earlier. The Trojan War has to be earlier than this because by 700 BC or just after, the Aeolians were uh, believed they, they lived in Troy, you know, they, um, Ilium. Um, mm -hmm. So the Greek, Greek settlers, the, the Aeolians, were in Hisarlik by about 700 BC spouting about Homer, so Homer has to have written them before then. Yeah, well, I, I don't know about that, but yeah, we can play the dates, but I, I'm just saying this, this would explain it beautifully, why, the, why they, they attacked Troy the way they did, they were kicking these people out.
For my, I mean, I own the, I think, is the original if, if, priest. If you want to call the, the uh, attack on Troy reasonably late, then it, it could well be argued that it's an early uh, stage in the uh, Greek colonization mm. of, of that area. Because by, uh, as we said, by 640 BC, um, all that western Aegean coast, Western Anatolia, is referred to as East Greek. East, East Greece. Well, I'm, I'm, because not, I'm you, not disputing you, that. All I'm you've saying got is the Ionians already there. Yeah. Um, and then they've been attacked by these so, people. So, so you wouldn't get Greeks attacking Aeolians who were Greeks. No, they would attack. So, so, the, so, so they would attack the, these kind of areas. Predate the Aeolian colonization of northwest. No, no, you're not Turkey. quite understanding what I'm saying. I'm sorry to keep holding you up, but what I'm saying is there were Greeks in I Ionia, right? And then these Chimerians come across and they conquer it, right? And then they take and they build this all, they take over Troy. And then the Greeks from, from Greece come across to get it back from their fellow, you know, on behalf of the Ionians who've been conquered by these Chimerians. So I'm looking at a more complicated mm. scenario. Yeah. I think, I, I, is that fanciful? No, I, I think the problem is that, that by that by this time, by the seventh century, it's pretty sure Homer had already been written. Mm. The, 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 well, one of the things that Ferdinandsky says is that you've got to. Velikovsky had it in about 740 BC. Did he? Yeah, um, he got rid of the Dark Age from oh, Greek careful. history. This answer is going to tie together what Bob was talking about as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think Velikovsky dated the Trojan War to 740 BC, uh, but he linked it to um, a close encounter of Mars and, and, and Venus because of the. Um, Homer talks endlessly about Mars and Venus being involved, um, but I think even that's that's too late. You better write it up for us. I'll mm. write you something on this. There's this theory. I mean, it's a, Why not? I know it's fanciful, but you know, what are we there for? But to be fanciful. Right. <laughs> Speculative. Speculative. Much more acceptable word. <laughs> so I believe the next meeting here, the main meeting, is the 27th of April. Is that right? The AGM? That's what I've got in my. If you've got, got it, then it's right. I mean, it, but do you know, does anybody know of another meeting before that? No. no anyway. So we'll see you on the 27th, and if anybody wants to come to my house for a study group, uh, the next one is on the 8th of November. And if anyone can have some editorial input, we'd be very good. Oh, yes. Welcome. Please write in to hmm. Barry or Philip or. Who else? Trevor. Oh, yeah, I think you have to write to Trevor, don't you? Well, any of us. Anyway, yes. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Barry. That was very, very interesting.